and I'll have to go, I, I know I'm staying between you and lunch here, so let me try to go quickly. Uh, if you don't think, I, I mean, I think Newton is one of the most brilliant, like the most brilliant ever to sort of walk the earth. And I'm not alone in feeling this. This is his statue in Trinity Church in Cambridge, and he's through the open doorway there. And so you get close to the statue. He's without his curls here. I was deeply upset by that. I thought he was like really trendy with his long hair. But apparently that was probably just a wig at all times. You look at the base of the statue, um, loosely translated, of the genus of all, of all who have ever been human, there is no greater intellect than this man. And so I'm not alone in this sentiment. And this man wrote those words. So, but let's move on because there's more to talk about here. We don't have to stop at Newton. Let's go to Christian Huygens, all right? Brilliant, brilliant scientist. I mean, he was great at chemistry, biology, physics, math, a Dutch scientist, and he died the year that this work was published, one of my favorite uh, works of science writing, uh, and it's Cosmotheros, which is a, an exploration on the likelihood of there being life on the known planets using the available knowledge of the day. So, for example, they knew that, uh, by the way, Huygens like, was the first to identify Saturn's ring as a ring, uh, if I got that right, uh, Carolyn, is that correct? Oh, no, I thought he was the first to calculate that it would be a ring. He was the then Huygens would be the first to observe it. Okay. We have Madam Saturn here in the room, uh, in case you don't know. Okay. Uh, uh, my colleague, Carolyn Porco, who we'll be hearing from later. Uh, I've just been told. But anyhow, so Huygens, brilliant fellow, and one of the probes on the Cassini spacecraft was called Huygens, a, a, a European probe that descended to the surface of Titan. And so he's, he's, in, he's an important figure in the history of science. So what, is, what, what does he say in his writings? Well, uh, uh, you look at the year, 1696, gravity was well known, laws of motion were well known, Newton was quite influential well before the turn of the century there. And so when he talks about the orbits of the planets, it's done. Talks about the moons of Jupiter, done. Talks about the new ring, rings around Saturn, done. It's all fine. But when he talks about biology and life, something that's not well understood then or today, boom, there goes his references to God. But references to God were nowhere else in those writings. Nowhere else, he says. I suppose nobody would deny, but that there's somewhat more of contrivance, somewhat more of miracle in the production and growth of plants and animals than in lifeless heaps of inanimate bodies. For the finger of God and the wisdom of divine providence is in them much more clearly manifested than in the other. He doesn't say that about the orbits. We're done with the orbits, as Mike Shermer had noted. We're done. He's in a place where nobody really know, has the answer. So he invokes, this is intelligent design once again. Pure out, flat, and simple. So you know this story. I have to tell it because it's just great. All right? So Laplace, uh, Pierre Simon de Laplace, uh, at the end of the 18th century, wrote a five-volume tome uh, on celestial mechanics, a brilliant piece of work. It was, it's there, it weighs a lot on the shelf, and it, what it does is it takes Newton's laws of gravity and brings them into, the, into a full expression with the hammer of calculus, okay? He brings all the armament of mathematics to bear on the laws of physics that were put forth by Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton only touched on them. They were not fully developed, and in this work, he demonstrates, he, he further develops something that had been percolating in the mathematical community, but he develops, and one might even say perfects, a branch of math we would call perturbation theory, where instead of pulling your hair out saying, well, how do you calculate this pair of forces and this pair and this pair and all the equations go to hell, in perturbation theory, it allows you to systematically and reliably calculate the effect of a small tug in the presence of a series of small tugs in the presence of singular big tugs. And that's kind of what most of the sol what's going on in most of the solar system. And when you do that, and you do that properly, you can demonstrate, notwithstanding effects of chaos, which have other timescales related to them, you can demonstrate that, in fact, the solar system was stable beyond the predictions of Isaac Newton. So he figures this out, does not invoke God, because he figured it out. And in a story that may be apocryphal, but I see more in support of it than against it, 
This, is, this time coincides, of course, with the era of Napoleon, Napoleon being French and Laplace being French, no translation necessary. Napoleon, if you visited his library, it's not just sort of books of world history and battles, it's engineering books, it's physics books. This man wanted to know where his cannonballs would land, all right? He was much more than just sort of a lucky general. He was into the physics, the engineering, and the material science of war. And so he immediately summoned up the five-volume production of Laplace, read it through, cover to cover, called in Laplace and said, sir, I have the exact quote here. Uh, hang on. Uh, uh, Napoleon asked him what role God played in the construction and regulation of the heavens. This is kind of like, that's what Newton would ask, right? Laplace replies, sir, I had no need for that hypothesis. And so what concerns me now is, even if you're as brilliant as Newton, you reach a point where you start basking in the majesty of God, and then your discovery stops. It just stops. You're kind of no good anymore for advancing that frontier, waiting for somebody else to come behind you who doesn't have God on the brain, and who says, that's a really cool problem, I want to solve it. They come in and solve it. But look at the time delay. This was a hundred-year time delay. And the math that's in perturbation theory is like crumbs for Newton. He could have come up with that. The guy invented calculus just on a dare, practically. When someone asked him, why, why, you, know, you know, Ike, how come planets orbit in ellipses and not some other shape? And he couldn't answer that. He goes home for two months, comes back, out comes integral differential calculus, because he needed that to answer that, to answer that question. And so, so this, is, this is the kind of mind we were dealing with with Newton. He could have gone there, but he didn't. He didn't. His religiosity stopped him. And so we're left with the, real, the, the realization, of course, that intelligent design, while real in the history of science, while real in the presence of sort of philosophical drivers, is nonetheless a philosophy of ignorance. And so regardless of what our political agenda is, all you have to say is science is a philosophy of discovery. Intelligent design is a philosophy of ignorance. That's all. I don't need to see whether, I don't need, if, have you discovered anything lately? If not, get out of the science classroom. But I'm not going to say, don't teach this, because it's, it's real, it happened. So I don't want people to sweep it under the rug, because if you do, you're neglecting something fundamental that's going on in people's minds when they confront things they don't understand. And it happens to the greatest of the minds as it happens to everyone else, many, if not most other people in the public. So let me blow through some last set of slides here. Uh, I want to call something to your attention that we all know, uh, um, we all know intuitively whether or not you've thought about it explicitly. You go around the world and you find times and places where nations have excelled in one subject or another. There's a birth of that period of, of where they excel and then there's a peak and sometimes it drops off and sometimes they hang on. And so you can ask the culture of that. What was going on in that nation to support those discoveries? And then what happened when they ended? And so I, I call that sort of naming rights. If you were there first and you did it best, you named things. Particle physics uh, in this country, in the United States, was like going gangbusters after the Second World War. And, and the discovery of atomic elements. Look at the periodic table. There's Berkelium, Californium. You know, we got half the United States up there in the upper, heavier elements of the periodic table. Uh, am I right there, sir, sir Weinberg? I, no, I don't want to. <laughs> that's, that's not because the world liked California or Berkeley. It's because the work was done here. It's because there was a there was a, um, an effort to excel in just those subjects. And it shows up in other ways, well, I'll give you just briefly. You know, um, part of the naming rights is that you don't have to name it. So for example, while we didn't invent the internet, we certainly exploited it here in America. We did that sort of first and best. And so your email address does not end in .us. Everybody else is in the world, they gotta say what country they came from. We don't, okay? <laughs> It's, it's simple, but it's, it's the consequence of being there first and doing it better than anyone had done it before. Do you know that the British postage stamp is the only postage stamp in the world that does not identify the country of origin? Because they invented postage stamps. <laughs> so why should they have to say what country it is? It's their invention. Okay? Check them out. It's, a, it's, it's just the facts of this. 
the constellations of the night sky. We, it's the Greek and Roman, and it's lasted to this time because they did a really good job thinking that stuff up. All the mythologies of the heavens, that really stuck with us. All right, so I'm going to make a larger point. Um, not to get gratuitous on you here, but September 11, 2001, uh, as we all know, this was going on uh, in New York City. Uh, this is the view outside of my window. I live four blocks from ground zero. Excuse me, this is the corner of the building in which I live. I went outside to get this view. I was, at the time, judging whether I should go collect my daughter, who was in an elementary school two blocks north of the North Tower. North is to the right in this picture. So I wanted to get a closer view with a highly magnified uh, zoom lens to see what, while that was happening, the plane flew into the South Tower. And so no one was thinking terrorism until the second one was hit. The first one was just sort of a bad tragedy. And so these are just three frames from my camcorder. This is at t equals zero. This is one second, well, like actually a fraction of a second. The plane was moving probably 500 miles an hour. And just to understand, the black building, that black sort of monolithic building, that is 50 stories tall. This is New York City, people. So tall buildings are kind of, they're just all over the place. And that's just a hotel, a 50-story hotel. And it's f the, the, the towers are foreshortened because they're the angle at which this is shown. I put these up because a few days after this, President Bush, I don't remember where he said this, on the steps of the White House, in the Rose Garden or at the Capitol, in an attempt to distinguish we from they, the terrorists who flew these planes into the buildings and into the... Uh, uh, that went down in Pennsylvania and at, at, in Washington, to distinguish we from they, he loosely quotes a phrase out of the Bible by saying, our God is the God who named the stars. Now, this is before I was on his Rolodex, okay? Uh, <laughs> because I could have helped him out there. The fact is, of all the stars that have names, Two-thirds of them have Arabic names. So this was not, I don't think, his intent <laughs> with that message. Okay? <laughs> While the constellations are Greek and Roman, the names are Arabic, all right? And the list just goes on and on and on and on. And so where does this come from? How does, how do, how do you get us, how does this happen? How do you get stars named with Arabic names. How does this happen? And it happens because, of course, because, hang on, just catching up with myself here. Okay? It happens because there was this particularly fertile period that um, Professor Weinberg duly discussed. Um, and around that period, that 300 year period, the intellectual center of the world was Baghdad. Baghdad. It was completely open to all visitors, all travelers, Jews, Christians, uh, doubters, which today we might call atheists. They were all there exchanging ideas, all of them, all of them. And it was that period where you had the advances in like engineering and, and biology and medicine and, and, and mathematics, all right? Our numerals are called what? Arabic numerals. They ever stop and think about that? You know, who's, who, as in America, do we pause, take pause at this? Why are they called Arabic numerals? Okay, they fully exploit the, the discovery of the zero, create a whole field called algebra, itself an Arabic word. Algorithm is an Arabic word. All this is going on, and it's all traceable, not to some long thousand-year tradition in, the, in Islam. It's traceable to this 300-year period. This 300-year period. And then, so they had naming rights. The most expensive, beautifully uh, carved astrolabes come out of this period. There's a great collection of these at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, if you ever want to check them out. So navigation, celestial navigation, all of this is traceable to this period. And so something happened. And what happened, as was previously described, I was told, and I, again, forgive me for repeating from what you might have heard, 12th century kicks in, and then you get the influence of this scholar, Al-Ghazali. All right? And so, so out of his work, you get the philosophy that mathematics is the work of the devil. And nothing good can come of that philosophy. 
That combined with other sort of codification, philosophical codifications of what Islam would, was and would become, the entire intellectual foundation of that enterprise collapsed and it has not recovered since. <laughs>